Welcome. I'm Dan Batista, the Executive Director of the Institute for Citizen Centered Service, simply known as the ICCS. Thank you for joining us for our webinar today with special guest speakers uh, Joel Circus and, uh, and Robert Ronberg of UiPath. In a moment, I will ask uh, Christian Labrador, Vice President of the ICCS, to formally introduce and welcome Robert and Joel. Before I turn it over to Christian, uh, I would like to take care of a few administrative details. First of all, please note that we are recording today's webinar and it will be available on our YouTube channel, uh, Citizen First, in the next day or two. To learn more about the ICCS and upcoming events, please visit our website, Citizens First, sorry, citizenfirst.ca. And we also encourage you to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at Citizen First. And finally, just a reminder uh, that this webinar is being presented uh, as an MS live event. So you'll be able to submit any questions you have uh, throughout the presentation using the Q&A function, which is available on the upper right hand side of your screen. We encourage you to submit your questions throughout the presentation and we'll do our best to have Joel and Robert respond to as many questions as possible before the top of the hour. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our Vice President, Christian Labrador, who will get our webinar started. Over to you, Chris. Thank you. Hello, bonjour. My name is Chris Labrador, and apart from being the Vice President of the ICCS, I'm also the Director General of Operations and Regional Services at the Immigration and Refugee Board. Il me fait plaisir d'être avec vous aujourd'hui. La session se fera principalement en anglais, mais nous vous invitons de soumettre vos questions dans la langue de votre choix. Today's session will be in English. However, participants are welcome to submit their questions in the language of their choice. Today, the ICCS is pleased to have Robert Ronberg and Joel Turkis of UiPath to share their insights on digital transformation with intelligent automation. I can attest personally to the work of UiPath as we have been working with them lately to develop multiple robotic automations for major business improvements. I can tell you that in one such instance, one of these improvements has translated to gains of 34 five hours per day in one circumstance and can give you more details if Joel and Robert don't speak to it. So on to our speakers. Joel Cherkis is a vice president of the global industries at UiPath. He has focused on driving industry specific solutions in support of digital transformation processes. Prior to joining, joining UiPath, he was global vice president with Oracle's industry solution group. And prior to that, he spent 11 years at Microsoft as the general manager of government and defense industry sales. Joel began his career as an application developer with ExxonMobil, where he developed mainframe and mid-range based applications that manage refinery, pipeline, and product packaging systems, in addition to helping develop the company's global customer accounting systems. Robert Ronberg is currently the senior account executive at UiPath. Rob has devoted over his 20 plus years career in key executive positions with SAS Institute Canada, Adobe, and Xerox. He was focused on assisting organizations adapt automated solutions and digital modernization to improve services to Canadian. And now over to our guests, speakers, Robert and Joel. Welcome. Joel, you're on mute. All right, you, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Good. All right, fantastic. Um, so um, thank you everybody for the opportunity to chat today. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, and as you heard, you know, uh, both Rob and I are, are with UiPath focused uh, almost 100% on public sector. Uh, Rob, they're based in the Ottawa area. I'm actually uh, south of the border, so I'm located in the Seattle area. Uh, but spent a bit of time working with Rob and the team there in Canada. Um, so our goal today really is to just talk a bit more about automation in the public sector, 
um, the entire uh, discussion from our perspective is to make sure that we're really talking about what's happening in the industry and why and where we think automation or, or where we know automation is helping, but where we think the automation space is going. Um, what I don't want to do is bore you with a, a lot of you know, market based slides, um, but I do think it's important to understand that the general direction in the business space is not in it um, is not where I thought it would be 10 years ago or 15 years ago, where the promise of a fully um, cloud enabled, fully integrated based environments across every type of system, uh, it, it's just not panning out. And that's not just my opinion, but some of the, the data points that you see on the slide here, uh, they come from um, you know the Wall Street Journal that's done some analysis. It comes from uh, some of the um, uh, the um, the big analysts, you know, the Gartners, the Foresters, the IDCs, there are some uh, governmental organizations. And what they find is, is that as time goes on, more complexity is appearing in the workplace. There are more systems that are in place. In fact, uh, the statistic there on the far right that says, you know, 70% increase in apps uh, within an organization over the last four years uh, has, has been tremendous. And if I, if each of you think about the type of applications that you have to interact with day in and day out, um, whether they're, they are integrated today or not, or whether there's swivel chair activities that people have to pull data from one system to put into a different system, uh, a lot of rules-based discussions. Um, there are, there's a tremendous amount of time that people spend doing these manual tasks. And our main interest is not necessarily taking people out of the tasks, but it's taking the low value processes that people do and putting those into an automation space so that people can focus on the high value types of things that they do, the things that that humans are good at doing, the, the cognitive sense. Now, when you look across the public sector, what you typically find is the challenges and, and you know, I've been in support of public sector agencies for uh, oh, oh, 25 years now. Um, and what you find is budget constraints have always been an issue. They continue to be an issue. You know, nobody has a lot of excess dollars, time, resources um, to, uh, to either build new systems, build new integrations. Um, in fact, here in the US, there is a, a fund that the US federal government's rolling out now. It's called the Technology Modernization Fund. And agencies can apply for funding for projects um, but it's really a first come first serve. So whoever has the loudest voice with the best project opportunity is gonna get the potential of funding. The question then becomes, what about ongoing years? If there is a software component, how will the licensing work? Uh, would the technology modernization fund continue to fund those types of things? Uh, would an organization have to pay back uh, any of the investments that are coming to them? And if so, what would that look like? And what we're finding is, is that when you look at automation in that sense, a lot of times the payback on automating certain types of processes end up paying for themselves. And I don't always wanna say it's in weeks, but we've seen many cases where customers have shown positive ROI in, in literally you know, six to eight weeks, uh, sometimes less. Uh, typically, I would say it's somewhere between you know two to five months, maybe. So just under a six month period, organizations are finding that um, they can show the positive result from a financial perspective. Um, the other things to think about are, um, you know, in today's world, when organizations are providing uh, benefits to to um, to their constituents, whether they're external or internal. So you know, maybe they're providing support to citizens or they're providing support to their internal workers. Uh, there are just so many different tasks that need to happen that backlogs exist. And so a key part of what we're trying to do is figure out ways or offer capabilities to help people be more productive um, while ultimately fulfilling their the obligation of the digital transformation world. Uh, and in some cases, it is the modernization of a system, and sometimes it's just the integration of the system using a digital worker. And I'm going to use the term automation, um, I'll use the term uh, robot, and I'll use the term digital worker interchangeably. Because think of it as a piece of software that works like a person would do, uh, and really is targeted at the areas that we're seeing here on the screen. Now, to give you an idea of what these digital workers do, for the most part, they emulate uh, human behavior. So they do what people would do. And I'll talk a little bit about how you figure out which um, processes are ripe or targeted for automation. Um, but again, think about anything that a worker would do where a digital worker could be put in place with a set of rules 
um, that can either integrate with existing systems that can move data from different types of systems or do analysis on systems, either rules-based or AI-based. And I'll talk a little bit about how some of those things work, but this is the real goal of, of uh, what organizations are trying to do with automation today. Now, what it is that the robots can actually do are really anything that a person could do in a digital fashion, meaning um, the, the movement of data, uh, monitoring um, transactions. So maybe it's monitoring an, an email inbox or monitoring a database or monitoring a portal to see if a submission has occurred. Uh, a very simple example, um, maybe invoice processing. So I have a lot of government organizations just because of the size of the organization. They have to deal with a lot of invoices from vendors um, and they have a person who each morning will open up an inbox, look for invoices that have come in. If they see an invoice, so one, they have to decide that that's an invoice, which as, as humans, it's easy for us to do, uh, but we can teach the robots to do the same type of thing. Uh, look through the invoice, decide what the invoice is for, and then swivel your activity, typical concept, open a different application, look to see uh, uh, in the purchasing system what the actual purchase order was for, and then compare them. If the invoice and the purchase order match, it's a simple concept, uh, and, and the terms are being met, then we go ahead and pay it. Robots are perfect for those types of things. Where you want people in the loop are if, if there is some exception, if anything on that is different. So for example, if the postal service is ordering fuel for the mail trucks and the amount of fuel that was ordered doesn't match the amount of fuel that was delivered into our, our tracking system, then you want to raise that to a person. And the robots are really good at saying, hey, I found an exception. Joel is the, is the procurement agent. I need to put this into his inbox. And in an inbox, there are a lot of different ways you can do it. You could, you could do something as simple as you know, sending tasks via Outlook. Uh, you could have uh, emails being sent or a, you know, a Slack or a Teams notification to somebody. Uh, we also for, at UiPath have a tool that we call Action Center that actually is a, think of it as a task box. And it's just a way for the robots and the people to work together. But this gives you an example of some of the types of things that the robots can ultimately do. The question always becomes, so what is it that we should look to automate? And on this slide, we give you some ideas of things uh, to think about, but really, you know, boil it down to this. Any types of, of activities that are fatiguing for employees, and fatiguing typically means that over time you'll end up with error. Uh, there is the potential, actually there's potential for error anywhere along the, the way. And if those errors then would cause you to redo the process or spend a lot of time trying to figure out where the error was, those are perfect candidates for automation. Other types of things, I had mentioned uh, the swivel chair concept, so in the bottom right there. Anytime you have two different systems and you have to move data from one to another and you do it frequently, that's a good place for automation to come into play. Um, for uh, um, very uh, repetitive tasks like you know, the Monday morning reports or the Friday reconciliation that needs to happen or the comparison of data from a spreadsheet or a database or an application with another type of system. Um, robots are perfect for doing these types of things. Where robots typically aren't a good play are if you have a scenario that doesn't happen very frequently or it happens very quickly, uh, doesn't take a lot of time or cycles. Uh, those are areas that are typically um, not really uh, a, a good idea to go for the automation up front just because the return that you get for the time invested just doesn't pan out. The other thing I'll, po I'll point out is um, looking at processes that have high amounts of backlogs. So again, that could be benefits processing types of things. It could be uh, contact centers where you have lots of people calling in or coming through chatbots trying to reach somebody for information. Um, but anything really that uh, um, where you have a backlog uh, putting robots in place to be able to handle that extra support as digital workers become very critical and, and very important. What we're finding, and this is an industry comment, and I'll tie it to public sector in a second, but um, really what this is saying is that organizations are looking across their business now at any process that they do as a candidate for automation. And I, I like to see this because when I joined UiPath just under three years ago, organizations would have a very specific thing that they wanted to automate, like the invoice processing uh, comment that I gave you. And in today's world now, organizations are saying, well, 
let's consider automation as a platform. So again, think of it as those digital workers. Where would I apply digital workers in my organization? Whether it's the procurement side or traditional finance and accounting, uh, are there supply chain or uh, HR, these types of topics. Uh, these are areas where organizations are really beginning to, to, uh, to expand the automation story across their business. Now, specifically in the public sector, um, and you know, as I mentioned, I deal with public sector organizations all day, every day, and I deal with both the federal and the local and regional government sides. And what we find is the, the blue boxes on the top that uh, are listed as commonly automated, these are areas that organizations are investing time and effort today. And we'll give you some examples of some of them. Uh, the beauty is every day or every at the end of every week, I have a whole new set of use cases with new customers who are doing some just really interesting things. And in some cases, it's just the traditional, you know, let me check these, you know, seven steps in this process. And if the robot can do those seven steps for me, it'll offload 80, 90, 95% of the workload so that people can spend the time on the high value things. Uh, the big result of these types of things, as I mentioned, are uh, backlogs tend to be reduced very, very quickly. Um, the um, acceptance rate or the efficiency of the transactions, meaning not finding errors uh, and being able to process quickly have gone up dramatically. And then a, a third and probably unintended result is that we see a lot of employee morale increasing because people are now saying, well, wait a minute, the organization has put a, some technology in place to help me do my job. And so the actual line workers, the people that are doing the invoice processing or answering the calls in the contact center, uh, they end up finding that um, the quality of the work that they're doing tends to go up as well. Uh, so employee morale is, is going up dramatically. And it, it, it was, I, I love to, to hear that. It was not one of the intended result or the intended uh, goals when we first started. Now, just to highlight a couple of the things that are on here. So I mentioned call center support up there in the upper left-hand uh, side. Uh, I would say that in today's world, that's probably the number one thing that we're seeing in public sector. Organizations everywhere are inundated, especially during COVID, the COVID crisis or any other type of crisis, um, that there just are not enough people to answer the questions that people have and people need to be able to reach someone. There is a lot more that's happening with chatbots, but even in, in many cases, the chatbots just don't have all of the answers. And in, a, in some scenarios, the chatbots even need to log into a system, extract some data, compare the data, do some rules-based processing, and then provide a result. So we're putting robots in place, not only behind the contact center agent as a person to make it easier and faster for them to deliver the service they need, typically resulting in shorter time on the call with whoever is, is making the phone call, uh, and thus they can support more people over a period of time, uh, but also making the, the, uh, the chatbots more efficient. The other um, area that I wanted to point out here uh, that has um, a tremendous amount of adoption is the HR side. So uh, in, in governments, there are usually lots of employees uh, when you look across the, the different agencies. Um, meaning new employees coming into an organization, employees transferring roles within an organization and, and employees leaving an organization, whether it's retirement or they're looking for something else in their career, uh, whatever it happens to be. And the processes are very standard for bringing a new employee on board. Uh, here at UiPath, when you, you're hired, uh, there's a whole set of things that need to happen, right? There's the creation of your employee ID. There's the allocation of a laptop. Uh, if you're going to be an office worker, what that office will be. Uh, if there's a designated phone or contact space for you, if there's a credit card that you'll need uh, in the event that travel will become part of your job. Um, but even things like setting up your training plan and who your work buddy would be. You know, these are things that you typically have an HR person that's kind of going through the different systems and setting up. Well, for us, those are prime areas for automation and putting robots in place to do those types of things. And that way, we use the HR people to do things like, well, how's Joel's career development going? He's been here 60 days now. And what is it that um, uh, we had goal-wise and how's he doing with those? Do we need to put some additional support in place? It should uh, uh, Are there other groups that he's working with that we should consider him being a part of? Those are the things the HR people will do because those are good cognitive types of services. The two that are on here though, that I think that are, are very exciting, 
and really where the big growth are coming. So in the bottom right there, or I guess in the middle right, the integrated eligibility. So think of this as benefits processing. So we have a lot of government organizations now that are using robots to aid in the process of uh, either new applicants that are looking for benefits or the renewal of benefits. And in many cases, the way the benefit processing systems work are, uh, if somebody's applying for some, you know, it, in today's world, let's say it's unemployment insurance because their job has gone away. Um, it's a pretty standard concept of, well, let's check to see um, you know, who their employer was. Let's verify that they are no longer employed there. Let's look to see what their uh, tax situation was over the past couple of years so we can determine what the benefit is that the person would be eligible for. Um, and with one of our customers, they had nine different systems that they had to check. Well, we found that the robots could go and check all nine systems in a fraction of the time, and literally about 3% of the time that a person needed, the robot could do all of the, the determination. And at the beginning, we would have the robot make the recommendation to an analyst. The analyst would then either say yes or no, because they were teaching the robot, um, you know, uh, where the exceptions would be in the rules. And what we found now is that 95% of the transactions are just processed by the robots. The 5% that aren't are typically areas where there are exceptions, like the person's applying for benefits for a family of four, but in the tax records, it only shows that there's a um, family of three living in the household. And then the question is, well, why is there one other person? And in talking with some of the customers, we found things like maybe the, the, um, uh, the parents don't live together anymore, and one of the children live with a parent in a different jurisdiction, and therefore they're covered from a different set of benefits. Those are things that robots are not going to figure out, at least in the near term. Those are things that the people will, will engage with. So this is people and robots working well together. The other one I wanted to call out there, almost in the middle of the screen, is fraud detection. So this concept is becoming a very big topic, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. But what we found is there are a lot of governments that are uh, paying for services or delivering services as benefits. And there, are, in, in many cases, are uh, annual reports that need to be uh, collected around fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, and we're finding robots are being useful in, in not just in recovering money that was misallocated, but really in making sure that the money is being sent to the right place at the right time. Um, now, to that point, on this next slide, these five areas are where we're seeing the biggest investments going. And I'll start right in the middle of the screen there because I was just talking about fraud, waste, and abuse. And my goal here with the screen, so just to give you an idea, this is an actual set of processes that we talk with customers about. And the way the slide is set up is the bullets that are at the top typically are showcasing some of the issues that exist in an organization. Uh, the benefit line, obviously, is where we think we can provide some sort of support. And then the value at the bottom is where we have customer examples where they've been able to benefit or, or the actual dollar amount of benefits. And some of it is time saved by people. Some of it's actual dollars that were saved either by, you know, um, uh, detecting fraudulent activity or reducing cyber attacks or those types of things. Um, but these are the areas uh, of investment going forward because many of the things I mentioned, things like HR or traditional invoice processing, those are already going through the automation process, and this is the next wave. So I want to just walk through these a little bit, just so you understand the way the the, um, the feedback has come to us from the customer base. Uh, starting on the left there in document processing. So think about anything that deals with a document, whether it's a digital document, a handwritten document, uh, or even the creation of a document that's then used to move data from one system to another. And that last example would be maybe one system produces a PDF and the PDF document is given to another person or sent to another person that then needs to be keyed into another system, maybe a different department, maybe a different agency, maybe even a different government, um, uh, you know, moving from the federal side to the, to the regional government, something along those lines. So we see a lot of these types of things. And we have many government organizations putting robots in place that literally do what a person would do. They monitor the inbox, they look for the PDF, they log in from one system to another. Uh, and whether that system happens to be a modern system with a web interface or whether it's a mainframe based environment or a combination of the both, the robots really don't care. They can work via API, they can work via uh, movement of 
um, a mouse and a keyboard. So we have a technology, uh, an AI technology we call computer vision, where the robots can literally look at a screen the way a, a human would look at a screen to determine the fields and figure out what data should go in them. Um, this comes in very handy if an API or a web service just doesn't exist. The second big pillar, context center modernization. I had given some examples of a little bit earlier, um, and really the big one for us right now is it, we, we hear this from customers, not just in government, but really any organization that has a big contact center. It could be telecommunications oriented, it could be education, uh, it could be law enforcement. Um, but what we typically hear is, is that the wait times for people to reach somebody tend to be too long. Uh, the amount of time it takes to answer a question for somebody tends to be too long, and thus the backlog of the people in the queue continues to grow. Um, and the complexity of the agent needing to collect information tends to grow. And I'll just give a simple example. If any of you have ever called into a contact center uh, for support, in fact, I needed to uh, talk to AT&T, who's my mobile provider. And I remember, you know, last week on the call with them, the first thing that they do is they ask me to validate who I am. I give them some information. Once they validate, they then say, you know, what, what what's the issue? Why are you calling me? Uh, and I tell them it's a billing question. And then the next thing they do is they say, listen, I'm going to put you on hold for about two minutes. And what they're doing is they're opening a bunch of different systems, the CRM system, the billing system, maybe the hardware management system. And they're trying to collect all the information they can to then help figure out what my problem will be. Once that is ultimately done, um, the um, uh, they'll then get back on the phone with me and they'll try to answer you know, whatever the question would be. What we're doing with robots is we're putting robots in place so that as soon as the call validation occurs and the call agent hits a button on the screen, the robot logs into all the different systems, pulls the appropriate information literally in seconds, and then produces a single pane of glass or a single window that then says, oh, this is Joel. Uh, he called two weeks ago about a billing question. He's also called three months ago about a hardware issue that's out there. Here's the top three relevant things from the, the uh, CRM system. It's a very simple concept for a person to do it. It just takes time. So putting robots in place to do this tends to help dramatically. Uh, I've talked about the fraud, waste, and abuse. One thing I wanted to call out there on the value at the bottom. So if any of you are looking at this and you see the numbers, so that first one is not a typo. It says $1 billion US for a large agency. So the use case there was the US uh, Federal Government Health and Human Services Organization. They have a fraud, waste, and abuse report that we reviewed with them. And what they pointed to was that about somewhere between three and 10% of their total budget falls into the misuse of dollars. Sometimes it's fraudulent, sometimes it's just a mispayment or an overpayment, sometimes it's money that's spent on a project that then is not audited, uh, but it falls into whatever categories they've defined. Their annual budget is $1.18 trillion. So if you could cut even 1%, of that fraud, waste, and abuse amount out, it's a tremendous amount of savings. What we did with them, though, was we worked through that report to figure out what percentage of that three to 10% they thought could be prevented if they could audit every single transaction, which with robots in place, you potentially can because the cost of putting a robot in place is nowhere near putting a person in place. And it is cost prohibitive to just have a number of employees available to audit every single transaction for large agencies. And so in this case, they came back and said somewhere between three and 14% of the, the dollars in the fraud, waste and abuse category could be prevented with automation. So we just did the simple math on the low end. We took 3% of 3% of their $1 trillion budget and the dollar amount comes out to be about $1 billion and $62 million that they could cut just by putting automation in place. Well, when we presented this up the chain for funding, and, and just to give you an idea, the cost to put automation in place is a fraction. It, it, it's a percent of a fraction of, of the savings that are there. Uh, they said, you know, we need to get a proof of concept up and running. And within a couple of weeks, they literally were being able to go through and process transactions uh, across the board, you know, whether these are dollars flowing for uh, medical use or subsidies for citizens, um, just a tremendous amount of savings. And just along that same theory, the middle sized agency, we did the same model, but we use the state of California Health and Human Services using their fraud, waste and abuse report. And then the small agency, we did the state of Georgia. So we just picked, you know, three different models that are out there. 
what we'd love to do is sit with any customer that has interest and we literally do a workshop. So it's think of it as a value engineering workshop and we'll figure out what the value is of automation. The other two I won't spend as much time on, but just to give you an idea, cybersecurity. So things like um, security operations centers for denial of service attacks. We find a lot of organizations are constantly monitoring the, you know, the hits on websites or things along those lines. Uh, and there is a certain profile of a transaction that's coming in. Once you know what the profile is and most security centers know what this is, you can put robots in place to start finding where the false positives would be, weed those out, and that way your security people are only focused on where the real threats are. Other cases are having robots that are doing things like watching for new devices that are coming into your network, checking for default username and password to make sure those have been changed, uh, making sure that uh, the devices are on the appropriate network, uh, or even new servers or PCs that are being brought into the environment, making sure that those are set up the right way, and then potentially dispatching a security analyst to fix any problems. Uh, so we have a lot of organizations that are going down that path. And then the last one, benefits processing. This is it's tied into fraud, waste, and abuse, but really it's any type of benefits that you are delivering to any type of uh, constituent, uh, whether it's internal or external, uh, a huge opportunity for automation. Now, a couple of points I wanted to make just about the technology itself. So this is not a pitch for UiPath as much as just so you understand how we look at automation. So the colored boxes there in the middle that start on the left with discover, uh, and go all the way to the light blue with measure. This is our methodology for how we look at automation. Our approach is not to just automate a process, but it's to help you understand what the things are that make sense to automate. So that's that kind of discover phase. Um, we wanna make it easy for you to go and build the automation. So we have a drag and drop environment. I'm gonna give you a slide to show you what that looks like, but it's build the environment. Uh, and then ultimately manage it and run it and have engagement with people. So the robots and the people are working together all the way to the point of measuring the outcome so that when you have the results of the robots, you can say, yes, this was a worthwhile investment uh, because it, it either gave the benefit we were expecting or potentially more um, and having some way to do that. And whether it's with our analytics tool or using, you know, if you're using a Tableau or a Power BI or some other analytics tool, uh, we'll, we'll plug into those pieces as well. But it is an end-to-end -end methodology, the way we've designed what our plans are uh, from an automation perspective. Now, I had mentioned what the tool uh, looked like. This is just giving you an idea of uh, one of the product pieces we have. It's called Studio. And Studio, think of it as Microsoft Visio, if any of you have used that. It's a drag and drop environment, and this is how you design an automation. There are two faces to Studio. So the one that's to the left there, that is the traditional studio environment where you can pretty much automate anything. It is a low code environment, which means if there is something complex that you want to build with a Python script, you can absolutely incorporate it. Um, but again, the goal is really to help you build an automation with as little coding as possible. On the bottom right is what we call Studio X, which is just a different skin to Studio. It's geared towards business uh, business users. So people that are familiar with using, you know, Outlook or uh, Excel or any of the G Suite products that are out there, uh, it is drag and drop. It is no code. So it's, you know, uh, point to the email inbox you want to look at, point to the file system where the document would be, uh, do a screen scrape from this particular website. Um, but it's all drag and drop, very simple and, and easy to use. Uh, now, what I want to do is give you an example of what uh, an automation would look like. And just for simplicity, because this is something I think that most people have done at some point. So this is a, you know, a minute long video. And what this does is this shows how uh, somebody that needs to submit a receipt from, you know, maybe a business expense into their, their system would work. So I'm going to run it and I'm going to do it with no sound. So I'll just talk through what's happening here. Um, but an automation was created because it's a repetitive process that has to happen. And in this case, somebody has gone to lunch uh, they've incurred an expense, they've taken a photo of their receipt, and very quickly you just see some color coding that hits the receipt there. That's the robot using its computer vision to identify the fields. It popped up a window that said, I see some numbers, can you tell me what the, the uh, tip amount was? Because that needs to be called out. And now it's logging into the expense system. So at UiPath we use Concur, uh, and in this case the robot is literally clicking through what a person would have gone through the process of doing. 
It looked at the date and time. Uh, it compares it to an Outlook calendar, so it knows the person was traveling. This was a dinner time. Uh, here's the dollar amount that it extracted. It pulled the uh, address and the provider, uh, and it's literally just filling out the process. Now, it's doing it at the speed a person would do it. You can speed the robots so they actually go faster uh, if you want them to be literally clicking through what's on the screen. And literally in that time period, it has gone through. There have been no errors. There's no trying to figure out, you know, more detail of what's on the receipt. Um, as long as you had that photo, everything happens very quickly and seamlessly. This is actually even a, um, it's a service we rolled out internally. And when we show it to customers, a lot of them go, oh, can you give us something like that? Uh, and the beauty is we're, we gladly share the source code or the source automation of how that works. You have to point it to the systems you have in the login process and things like that or if there's an API that you can feed. Now, I've given you a lot of examples um, and, and talked about where it's landing in public sector. What I'd like to do is just transition here. Um, and, uh, you know, Rob's been doing a tremendous amount of work there in Canada. And so I figure, Rob, if you could talk through some of the uh, examples of where we've been working and what some of the successes are, I think that'd be helpful. Yeah, thank you, Joel. Thank you, Joel. you can hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, so a little bit of a lens into some of the work we've done with different federal uh, agencies, departments, and crowns, and then there's some others at the at the bottom of the list there. But um, it, I'd, I'd like to hear from Chris after as well because the IRB use case for the file conversion um, of some of the uh, the hearings that they record is very very compelling. But I'll, I'll I'll go through a few of these quickly, and it touches on many of those uh, business areas that uh, you outlined up front, Joel, and then maybe Chris can speak to and I can help him through some of what we've done with IRB, but talk about that at a high level. But um, very quickly, Transport Canada, uh, they started down the automation path about a year and a half to two years ago, and they had some outside help to understand where they could derive, you know, some of the benefits and, and the impacts that that could have organizationally. So they started within finance and admin, and salary forecasting and delegation of authorities were the two primary use cases that they automated. But when they looked across finance and HR, um, they did an assessment and learned that there was about 19,000 hours of manual work that could be avoided, meaning they're giving back that time to the existing workforce by eliminating a lot of the tasks and activities that consume a lot of time. They have many disparate systems, some legacy, a lot of COTS that don't natively interconnect. and you know, it, it drives a lot of work upon people, but their numbers that they publicly talked about, um, you know, demonstrate a, a potential um, hour savings of about 19,000 hours across more finance and HR. They've also done some interesting work within marine safety, the National Emergency Coordination Center, which was set up in response to COVID. Um, they do vessel inspections and they need to update the National Emergency Coordination Center does a lot of updates to brief the minister and other stakeholders in public safety on flight schedules, what air carriers have changed their flights and who's coming in at what airport. And people were spending a lot of time going to websites, Air Transat, Air Canada, you pick, and updating flight schedules into the database that they can then present and do a dashboard. So they use robots to do that and limit the amount of time that their highly paid data scientists and analysts were spending. And vessel inspections is something that they've just done recently as well going to external websites, international sites to reference vessel information, inspection information, and then pull that into a database that informs um, inspectors in field more efficiently, saving them the time to have to do that. Joel talked about benefits, um, social benefits. Um, Employment Social Development Canada has done a lot of work. One of the first automations that they built was within the Guaranteed Income Supplement uh, area. So in the pensions program, so think auto enrollment, you hit age of majority and your stated income from last cal or fiscal year is below a certain threshold that would entitle you the guaranteed income supplement benefit. Um, prior to automation, they were having people receive, review, update and approve many of those uh, applications. So they just created a rule to say if we have last year's known stated income, and the person is turning age of majority, auto enroll them into the program. And so they've automated a lot of transactions that would otherwise have, um, you know, required people to do processing on that. So they've seen a lot of benefit. They've since now expanded that into the call center area where they've deployed robots to a lot of the agencies Joel was touching on.
to just reduce the amount of time it takes them to query disparate systems, to do logins, reference information so they can deliver a better service faster to callers, uh, a lot of which, you know, as you can appreciate from COVID has created unforeseen volumes. So um, some interesting use cases there. Um, Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada, ATIP, Access to Information and Privacy. Um, they actually have a portal that doesn't natively connect to the case management system. So people will remit an application for an ATIP. I would like some information about, as an example, my application for permanent or temporary residence. Um, that'll create a PDF file and an HTML file from the portal that an analyst would then key into their case management system for ATIPs. So the simple use case there is a robot running on the workstation of the analysts will read the file, copy the data, and enter it into the case management system with some rules. And the rules are fairly simple, but important, meaning uh, verify if the applicant has made a request before. If yes, is this a duplicate request? Are they just bombarding us with requests? Uh, if no, create a new entry and ensure that they've been charged the five dollars and that that's been paid and then the analysts can do their you know work on the file from there they're also looking at uh, finance transformation reconciliations things like what transport was talking about but uh, operations the temporary residents to permanent residents they've done some work there to receive applications with attachments documents for immigrants and really the use case there is to upload those to back-end systems because there's many documents for principal applicants and family members. And it's a very, very time consuming task to do nothing but update the system of record with those attachments. Um, a, a Canada Revenue Agency is a customer of ours, Department of National Defense. Um, when Joel talked about HR, both DND and CBSA um, are doing some things in that respect. HR, CIV, the civilian team, um, at DND is is using automation to streamline onboarding uh, of new employees. If there's paperwork attributed to relocations or deployments, there's a lot of manual processes that uh, are involved around that. They're looking to to streamline a lot of those. So there's work in flight there. One of the interesting use case from an HR perspective that's on CBSA's radar is uh, compensation. So there's multiple unions across many of the organizations in government, but all of which they need to be updated when, you know, a person is promoted or their job classification changes. There's a litany of backlog, you know, file, a backlog for files that need to be sent to the union. So the intent there is to automate the process of when an employee's job classification status changes, um, send an update to the union so that all of that is on record and it's automated. It's not in a pile sitting on someone's desk that continues to build. So some interesting uh, applications there. And in healthcare, um, as you can imagine, there's there's a, a bundle of opportunity or, or challenges within the systems uh, today where, you know, the major, the major hospital use case is interesting. It's outside of Canada, but we are having conversations within the healthcare space here um think of nursing staff frontline caregivers um spending a lot of time doing updates um on treatments that have been administered uh referencing medical records robots can do lookups robots can do data extraction robots can do uploads of uh of information attributed to uh, patient treatments and the use case here it's say two to three hours a day of um of nursing staff time or frontline caregivers time by avoiding them having to do manual lookups and updates across multiple systems. Maybe Chris, if you wanted to touch on your use case within IRB, I think it's incredibly compelling. And if there's anything I can add to help with it, certainly I will, but uh, I, I, I love it. And I think it would be very interesting for the group to hear about. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, so here at the IRB at Immigration Refugee Board, we are the ones that hear uh, refugee uh, claims of people that are coming in the country and want to be, uh, become Canadians, as well as refugee appeals, immigration detention, and a few other things. We do about 350 hearings a day, which is huge. And we're the biggest, largest uh, administrative tribunal in Canada. All of these hearings right now are video recorded uh, for us. And then what we need to we needed to do is take the video recordings, scrape off the audio recording so that we can send it to transcription services 
This used to take about 30 minutes per video that we had to, had to do. So we actually put down uh, together a robotics process improvement. And this is where I said that we were saving about 35 hours a day uh, just doing that. So that was a, an amazing uh, thing for us. And what happened is that we could actually redirect our workforce that was doing that to higher value added uh, work, such as a quality assurance work, which is extremely essential for us in our, our decision making. Next up, we're also looking at scraping uh, some of the jurisprudence, uh, some of the research products in, uh, on country of origin information. It's all information that's useful for the adjudicators when they, they want to make informed decisions. So as you're looking at your case file, then the, the robot would be in the background looking for that information for you. So it, it would save a lot of time for the members or the adjudicators. And also we're doing work on for HR, on finance, for onboarding, invoice payment, all of these things. And it is a, it is a savings in time and actually being able to direct people to actually higher value added work. So. And Chris, if I can ask you uh, a simple question, how many how many people on the team right now are actually supporting you with developing the automations? In the IT shop? In in IRB, yeah. Uh, well, apart from uh, your group, I think we only have two people on that do yeah. this. So yeah, yeah, and that was part of what I, I I wanted you know the group to understand is that you know there's not armies of people needed to build out these automations. Your lead, Eric, on your team, self-taught. Right, yeah. he has some programming experience and he's technically proficient, but he picked up how to how to develop automations in UiPath on his own. And all of our training is free, freely available online, so people can self-enable. But he started and built things out very, very quickly on his own. And so you're a very nimble team, but you've delivered a tremendous amount of benefit back to the organization with a small group, which no, speaks to what Joel was touching on earlier. Yeah, I think what Joel said was saying that, you know, I think you, Joel, you mentioned some kind of a time frame about uh, six weeks to two months. And I think I believe that's probably exactly you're hitting the nail right on the head when it comes down to actually implementing a robot. Uh, I think we can do it now due to the, the fact that we have a lot more experience quicker, but uh, six weeks sounds like a reasonable. Uh, we have three week sprints, so it works perfectly for us usually. So Joel, that was good for me in terms of uh, a little bit of the the overview there. And if there's questions, certainly happy to answer them. But if there's more you wanted to continue with, uh, and Chris, thank you for that. Much appreciated. No, I think that's uh, that's fantastic. And you know, Chris is as somebody who's doing this every day. I think brings you know really a lot of uh, validation to the story. Um, and Rob, you know, it's great that you were able to walk through uh, the examples that you had. There are a couple others that are listed on the slide, which I'm sure people can read through, you know, and 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 the beauty is when you look across your automation or your, your organization, think about the role that automation can play and all of the types of scenarios that we just talked about. I think that's the important thing. Uh, and if you're, you know, if you have questions or you're interested in more conversation, you know, Rob and I and the entire team that we have there in Canada and, and elsewhere, we love to engage in these conversations to do ideation. You know, what, what are the things that you hate uh, and internally, we use the term automate what you hate. And, you know, as employees, we have a submission place uh, and can think of it as a suggestion box where you can go, oh, you know what, I have to do this thing. It's just part of my normal job. And it might be a report. It might be a processing of something that just takes time. Um, people can nominate what they're looking for. And I think per the comment about the number of developers that are required, it, it's actually a relatively small lift for people to get started and then once they get started i think it just becomes the natural conversation you know whether you're looking at you know the the benefits side of the contact side whatever it happens to be um so uh uh one other comment i just wanted to point out rob mentioned the training that we have so our entire training catalog is available you know rob said it's free um we purposefully wanted to make it a no cost 
capability for anybody that wants to get proficient. And so there are two things that we do. One, we have, it's called the UiPath Academy. It's available again, as I said, at no cost. You can take all of the training. It's the same training all of our developers take. Uh, any of the big system integrators, they take the same training. Um, but uh, the other thing that we do is we've actually packaged that up and we work with universities and we give it to the universities as something that we call the uh, Academic Alliance. And the reason is, we're seeing such a big uptick in automation adoption that there aren't enough people that really understand the automation principles out there. So we're trying to make it easy for the universities to teach it. So we've created the curriculum. We work with the university on what the program would be and the, and the professors. We have an entire team that does that. Uh, and the adoption of that academic alliance has just been tremendous. But really, it's bringing the next generation of automation professionals, you know, getting them ready for the workforce. Um, but again, you know, I've, I've been in the workforce for many years. I sat down, I took the four hour training for the business user and I was building my own automations to the point where I felt, oh, look, I'm really dangerous. Look at all the stuff I could do. And I just started building all kinds of automations. I found very quickly the ones that are the most repetitive or that take the most amount of time. Those are the ones I should be focused on. Yeah. So anyway, I'll pause there if there are comments or questions. Well, thank you very much, Joel and uh, Rob. So I've got a couple of questions and I see, uh, Rob, that you've already answered one on traceability and uh, which is important, how to trace back the decision of a robot. And there was really, a, a, the, the question was really focused on how easy is it, is it? but uh, in the uh, Q's and A's, you've answered that. I think it's uh, quite easy to trace back when a, the robot made a decision, at what point in time where they made the decision. So that's uh, extremely important. There was a question on security compliance. If you have any example, would uh, Rob or Joel be able to answer? Yeah, Joel, that question came up as you were walking through the blue blocked slides of domains where automation has uh, you know been applied and, and proven to deliver some value. So more on the uh, security, governance, and compliance use case envelope, I guess, is the nature of the question. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I'll try to be uh, precise just because I tend to go on on some of these things. So here, here's one thing that we see. Um, a lot of, so compliance when it comes to reporting or reconciliation becomes a big thing. So it could be, you know, going through a compliance requirement for a certification or validation. Uh, we actually have a lot of large financial institutions that use automation to do compliance checking for things like quarterly earnings reports, right? And the reason is there's just a lot of different systems, a lot of numbers that have to be checked and rechecked. You got to compare for year over year growth numbers like that. So in the banking and financial services space, it's tremendous. Uh, definitely in the government space for either the compliance for submission of compliance or uh, if you are the compliance processing entity. And I'll give you an example, the US Patent and Trademark Office in the US, they're the people that manage all the copyrights, patents, trademarks, everything. And it's gotta be just a daunting task that whenever a new, you know, let's say a, um, a patent request comes in, you have to search through all of the existing patents to make sure that, you know, it's gonna, it, it'll do what it's supposed to do and not step on someone else's patent. And so that organization actually built their own machine learning models. And the problem that they had was they got the models that they could then feed each submission into, but it was time consuming. How to tee up the model, how to get the output of the model, how to make the decisions. And so they wrapped robots around the front and the back end of that process. And now all of the submissions are happening. And uh, the last I had heard, it was somewhere like a six to seven year wait when you submitted a patent before it would be processed. There are just that many that are in the queue. And I can't give you specifics as to what the timeline will be. In fact, they specifically don't wanna set a service level agreement. So people think it'll be dramatically faster, but it will be dramatically faster. I mean, literally it'll be, it, it could be months, if not weeks for our, in, in the very near future. Again, I, I don't wanna go and, and uh, commit the US government to something that they're not ready to, to, to do, but the Patent and Trademark Office is using it for you know compliance in that very space and it works extremely well. Well, thank you, Joel. Uh, so I have one more question uh, because we have, we're have we running out of time. We have five minutes left and I also want to make a little public announcement at the end. So the last question I have for you, it says, isn't hyper automation taking RPA and applying ML, which I imagine is machine learning, to optimize processes? In that case, depending on the machine learning algorithm, it may not be easy to have 
algo explainability, but for certain algos, it could be easier to explain the decisions, decision making process. Are so I can I can take a, a stab at that and, and speak to it in a couple of parts. Firstly, the statement is correct. Hyper automation is about, you know, using standard automation and decision logic with, you know, AI or machine learning that becomes intelligent automation where it's the combination of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and more of a standardized rule set that robots can can manage. Uh, when it comes to ethical AI, algorithm explainability, the underlying logic that um, models are built with, um, we build some models, generally the underlying logic behind those, meaning a, a model that would interpret a document type. This is a passport, this is an invoice, this is a statement. Um, we would publish that and there's models. So we, we make those available. The underlying logic is there. If that satisfies the explainability obligations of, of the government, then absolutely um, we make that available. There's openly available uh, models in, in the public forum that you can use and you can develop your own. At the end of the day, you know, my position would be ensure that the explainability satisfies, you know, what, what's needed. The other comment I would make is that robots do not need to make decisions, meaning you can get all of the process designed such that it hands it off uh, to a person, but it's compiled all of the information to them for, for them to review to make that judgment. You could have the robot say based off of a standard rule set, yes, no, refer for further review, but you don't have to do that. So robots can prepare the information to present to people so they make decisions. It's not, doesn't have to run end to end. Robots and people can work together in that manner. Thank you very much, uh, Rob. So first and foremost, I wanted to thank everyone for joining us. Merci vous êtes joint à nous. We are wondering if there's an interest for a potential workshop by UiPath to explore potential opportunities in more detail. If you are interested, I suggest that you contact us at the uh, info at iccs 